Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's my pleasure to welcome Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin III to the Pentagon Briefing Room. The Secretary will deliver opening remarks and then take your questions. Please note that I will moderate those questions and call on journalists, so I'd ask that you raise your hand. If you have a question, wait to be recognized, uh, and I'll, I'll call upon you. Uh, with that, over to you, Mr. Secretary. Thanks, Pat. Good morning. It's been a difficult few days for the Department of Defense, and the entire department is united in our outrage and sorrow over the death of three U.S. service members on Sunday in Jordan. We all mourn the loss of three Army Reserve soldiers serving at Tower 22. Sergeant William J. Rivers, age 46, Sergeant Kennedy L. Sanders, age 24, and Sergeant Brianna A. Moffitt, age 23. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families and their loved ones, and we know that this grief will never leave them. And we hope that they know that the department's love and support will never leave them either. We're also praying for the other American troops who were wounded. Now, our teammates were killed when a one-way attack drone struck their living quarters. And we continue to gather the facts about this deadly attack. Our fallen soldiers had a vital mission to support Operation Inherent Resolve and to work with our partners to ensure the lasting defeat of ISIS. They risked their lives and lost their lives to keep their fellow Americans safe from global terrorism. The President will not tolerate attacks on American troops, and neither will I. Our teammates were killed by radical militias backed by Iran and operating inside Syria and Iraq. In the aftermath of the vile Hamas terrorist assault on Israel on October 7th, terrorist groups backed by Iran and funded by Iran have tried to create even more turmoil, including the Houthis attacking commercial shipping in the Red Sea. So this is a dangerous moment in the Middle East. We will continue to work to avoid a wider conflict in the region, but we will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our interests, and our people. And we will respond when we choose, where we choose, and how we choose. Now, that's what everyone here is focused on. But in my first week back in the Pentagon, I did want to address my recent hospital stay and some of the issues around it. I'm recovering well, but as you can see, I'm still recovering. I'm still having some leg pain and doing physical therapy to get past it. I'm deeply grateful to my doctors and the nursing staff at Walter Reed, and I very much appreciate all the good wishes. But I want to be crystal clear. We did not handle this right and I did not handle this right. I should have told the President about my cancer diagnosis. I should have also told my team and the American public. And I take full responsibility. I apologize to my teammates and to the American people. Now, I want to make it very clear that there were no gaps in authorities and no risk to the Department's command and control. At every moment, either I or the Deputy Secretary was in full charge. And we've already put in place some new procedures to make sure that any lapses in notification don't happen. In the future, if the Deputy Secretary needs to temporarily assume the, off the duties of my office, she and several White House offices will be immediately notified, including the White House Situation Room. And so will key officials across the Department. And the reason for that assumption of duties will be included in writing. Now, I want you all to know, that, to know why this happened. I was being treated for prostate cancer. The news shook me, and I know that it shakes so many others, especially in the black community. It was a gut punch. And frankly, my first instinct was to keep it private. I don't think it's news that I'm a pretty private guy. I never like uh, burdening others with my problems. It's just not my way. But I've learned from this experience. 
So taking this kind of job means losing some of the privacy that most of us expect. The American people have a right to know if their leaders are facing health challenges that might affect their ability to perform their duties, even temporarily. So a wider circle should have been notified, especially the President. I'll take your questions today, but as you know, we've got an ongoing internal review, as well as a DOD Inspector General review that we fully support. So I may have to discuss some aspects later. Now, let me back up a bit. As you know, on 22nd December, I had a minimally invasive procedure to cure me of my recently diagnosed prostate cancer. And then I hit some bad luck during what is usually a pretty easy recovery. On January 1st, I felt severe leg pain and, and pain in the abdomen and hip. And that evening, an ambulance took me to Walter Reed. The doctors found that I had several issues that needed treatment, including a bladder infection and abdominal problems. On January 2nd, I was also experiencing fever and chills and shallow breathing. The medical staff decided to transfer me to the critical care unit for several days for, for closer monitoring and better uh, team care by my doctors. And the deputy secretary assumed the functions and duties of my office, which happens when necessary. Her senior staff, my senior staff, and the joint staff were notified of this through our regular email notification procedures. And I never directed anyone to keep my January hospitalization from the White House. On January 5th, I resumed my functions and duties as secretary from the hospital. I was functioning, functioning well mentally, but not so well physically, and so I stayed at Walter Reed for additional time uh, for additional treatment, including physical therapy, for some lingering issues with my leg. Now, I'm offering all of this as an explanation and not an excuse. I am very proud of what we've achieved at the department over the past three years, but we fell short on this one. As a rule, I don't talk about conversations with my boss, but I can tell you I've apologized directly to President Biden. And I've told him that I'm deeply sorry for not letting him know immediately that I received a heavy diagnosis and was getting treatment. And he has responded with the grace and warm heart that anyone who knows President Biden would expect. And I'm grateful for his full confidence in me. And finally, I also missed an opportunity to send a message on an important public health issue. And I'd like to fix that right now. I was diagnosed with a highly treatable form of cancer, a pretty common one. One in eight American men will get prostate cancer one in six black men will get it. And so I'm here with a clear message to other men, especially older men. Get screened, get your regular checkups. Prostate cancer has a glass jaw. If your doctor can spot it, they can treat it and beat it. And the side effects that I experienced are highly, highly unusual. So you can count on me to set a better example on this issue today and for the rest of my life. And again, I want to thank everyone for their well wishes and their great support. And with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. First question will go to Associated Press. Lita. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You said that uh, you never directed anyone to keep this from the White House. Did you direct your staff or others to keep it from the public and from other senior staff members? And if you did not, has anyone been disciplined for doing something that you did not tell them to do. And then just quickly on uh, Iraq and, and Syria, what is your response to the uh, KH statement today that um, they are postponing or not doing any more attacks? Thank you. Good morning, Lita. Good morning. <laughs> to answer your question on whether or not I directed uh, my staff to conceal my hospitalization from anyone else, the answer is no. Um, in terms of uh, my, my response to KH's statement, um, we always listen to what people are saying, but we watch what they do. And, and again, uh, actions are everything. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens in the future. 
Okay, next question, we'll go to Fox, Jennifer. Um, sir, during that time that you were in the intensive care unit, there was an airstrike carried out, a drone strike against a, um, an Iraqi uh, leader of a militia. How is it that, um, do you regret that the authorities were not clear at that point and um, what can you explain about what was going through your mind at that time? And then separately, there's been a lot of telegraphing about targeting and responding to the drone strike, so much so that the Iranian proxy leaders have left the country. Some are back in, in Tehran. Um, has there been too much telegraphing, or is the point not to kill any Iranian commanders? Um. <clears throat> Regarding the strike on the 8th, Jen, um, that strike was, uh, was planned and I, I had made recommendations to the President on, uh, on, on actions that we should carry out uh, and the and President made a decision uh, and based upon that decision, authorities were pushed down to the Central Command commander uh, and as you know, a strike like that, uh, you can't pick the precise time when that strike is going to take place. You want to minimize collateral damage. You want to make sure that you have everything right. And so uh, the uh, subordinate commander had the controls on that particular strike. So that uh, I was very much involved in the, in, the, in planning and the recommendations for that. And we knew that that would take place uh, uh, within a matter of days. Um, in terms of uh, telegraphing about strikes and whether or not uh, uh, people uh, leave or would have left, you know, I won't speculate uh, on, uh, on any of that. I would just tell you that, uh, you know, it, we will have a, a multi-tiered response. Uh, and, uh, and again, we have the ability to, uh, uh, to respond uh, a, number, in a, a number of times, depending on what the situation is. Okay. Let's go to Reuters. Phil? Um, what did your deputy know uh, about your condition, and when did you know it? Yeah, Phil, I, I think uh, in terms of what she knew and didn't know, I think we should probably let the, that uh, come out of the review. I think I, I won't speculate on what she knew and did not know uh, based upon what information was passed to, to her. Again, I think the details of that will come out of uh, one or both of those reviews. So. Okay. Gordon? So, Mr. Secretary, um, you said you didn't direct your staff to hide this truth or, or lie, but did you create a culture of secrecy that then uh, the staff kind of interpreted <clears throat> your, your desires or your um, intentions when it came to you getting sick? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I don't think I've created a culture of secrecy. Uh, I think uh, there will be uh, security officers, there will be other staff members who who may perceive that uh, they're doing things in my best interest, and you know I can't, I can't uh, uh, predict or, or determine or ascertain what those things may be. I just know what I said and uh, and did not say, and of course, uh, you know I, I have a great staff, and, and they always uh, want to intend to do uh, the right things, but in terms of what m one may or may not have perceived at any one point in time, I won't speculate on that. Let's go to ABC. Hi, sir. Um, thank you for doing this, and uh, I think on behalf of all of us here, we wish you a speedy uh, recovery. Um, I'd like to ask you about the current situation in the Middle East. The, the message has been deterrence, deterring the attacks by the Houthis, deterring the attacks by the militias. Um, has deterrence failed? And if you are going to retaliate at the time and place of your choosing, is that not an escalation, particularly given all the rhetoric with Iran? And a question on your recovery, sir. Um, at any point, did you feel that you, your situation had caused you to consider possibly resigning, uh, given all of the political attention that, that had developed as a result of it? Um, in terms of resignation, the answer is no. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, of escalation in the Middle East, uh, you know, our, our goal was to make sure that that we contain uh, this crisis uh, in, uh, in 
in Gaza, uh, and uh, and that we prevented things from from spreading to a wider wider conflict. Now, there's a lot of activity uh, in the region, but there's always been a lot of activity in the region, and and you know well that. Uh, Iranian proxy groups have been attacking our troops uh, even well before October 7th. And you can go, we can go back and count the numbers of attacks before o October 7th, uh, and, and they're not insignificant. Um, there, there are things uh, that are ongoing now, uh, well, things are not ongoing. You know, we, we don't see a, a conflict, an all-out conflict between Israel uh, and Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, and so I think managing that, I think, is a... Uh, uh, has been artfully done, and, and so you know we remain in contact with our uh, Israeli counterparts and make sure that that doesn't uh, blossom into a, a, a war on another front. Uh, we don't see Israel engaged in uh, in a conflict with other countries in the region. We're not at war with with Iran, uh, and yeah, the Houthis uh, continue to do some things that are very uh, irresponsible and illegal, and uh, and so. Uh, our goal is to make sure that we take away, we continue to take away capability from the Houthis uh, to do what they've been doing. And this is not a, uh, this is not a U.S. issue. This is an international issue. You know, we're going to either be serious about the freedom of navigation, uh, and uh, or or we're not. And, and and so as we look at partners like the U.K. and so many others that have joined us uh, in this effort. Uh, this is about freedom of navigation. There are others in the world that are watching this to see how, how serious we are about this, and we are serious. Uh, and, and again, our partners and allies are serious about it as well. This is costing uh, uh, countries and companies significant amounts of money as, uh, as they've had to redirect uh, commercial traffic around. But the Houthis, uh, I mean, their activity needs to come to a halt, and we will call upon Iran to, uh, to quit or to cease supplying the Houthis with, uh, with these advanced conventional weapons that they've used <laughs> to attack ships in the, in the Red Sea and the Bab El Mandeb. Okay, let's go to Lee. Uh, sir, commiserations on your illness, is it, and it's good to see you back on your feet. Um, At least on one foot. On one foot. <laughs> uh, uh, you said uh, that you never directed your staff to keep the news of your hospitalization uh, from, the, from anyone. Uh, did any senior members of your family or your wife direct people to keep this a secret? Um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, no members. Well, I don't know. I don't know what anyone on my on my staff may have said. But it, I think these things will come out uh, in the, in the review. And so, rather than speculate, I, I think we should we should let that uh, the facts come out as the review is done. So. Can I ask you one more sure. question about you? It, 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 you mentioned during your opening statement that uh, this was an opportunity to talk about prostate cancer, especially in the black community. I wonder, though, do you have any regret that your <clears throat> silence on this reinforced this culture of secrecy among black black men about prostate cancer? Yeah, and you mentioned that, uh, and it's probably not a uh, an issue of secrecy as much as it's an issue of privacy. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a very, cancer period is, is very private. And there may be cancer survivors amongst, amongst us in this room right here. And I know there is at least a couple. There are at least a couple. Uh, but, but you know uh, how, how private that, that is. Uh, uh, and, and you know what the initial diagnosis feels like. And, uh, uh, and so, among the black community, though, it's it's even more a, a thing that that people want to want to keep private. And and again, it's more about privacy than secrecy. Uh, in my case, uh, I should have informed my boss. I did not. That was a mistake. Uh, and uh, and again, I apologize to him for not doing so. That's good. NPR. Mr. Secretary, you went to the hospital on December 22nd. Was your staff aware that you'd gone to the hospital? And if so. Why didn't they tell the White House? You went back to the hospital on January 1st, and an aide told the dispatcher, uh, when the ambulance arrives, no lights, no sirens. Did you direct the aide to say that? I asked uh, my assistant to call the ambulance. I did not direct him uh, to do anything further than just call the ambulance. 
Uh, and so what he said uh, and why he said it, I think that should come out in the, in the review as well. So. What about December 22nd when you went to the hospital the first time? Was the staff aware? And if so, why didn't they tell the White House? When, when I went to the hospital on December 22nd, uh, it was, I went in for that procedure. Uh, my duties were transferred to the deputy. That was planned, and, uh, and I decided to stay in the hospital overnight. Didn't have to, decided to stay there overnight uh, because of the anesthesia that was involved. Uh, and then the next day, later in the afternoon, early evening, we transferred uh, authorities back. So I'm talking about your staff. Okay. Were but your staff aware? And why did they Peter? tell the White House? Mr. Secretary, first of all, we wish you good health and thank you for taking our questions. We hope you have a quick recovery. I have two questions. I'll start with the first one on your hospitalization. You were hospitalized for days before you informed the White House or the Commander in Chief of your condition and your absence. Anyone else within the military chain of command would have faced reprimand or even dismissal. Why shouldn't that same standard apply to you, sir? Well, let me just say that, uh, uh, thanks for the question, that, that we didn't get this right. And as I said, I take full responsibility for, uh, for uh, the department's actions. Uh, in terms of why uh, on the second notification was, was not made to the White House, uh, that information was available. Uh, I'm not sure uh, at this point uh, what exactly happened, but I think details uh, will, uh, will play out as the review is, is conducted. So. Okay, let's can follow up about the situation overseas right now and the deliberation in regards to strikes. There have been more than 160 strikes on American targets across the region, as you noted, since October. Why has the U.S. waited until American service members were killed to escalate its response? Well, um, as you know, we've responded a number of times uh, and taken out, uh, um, first of all, th their attacks. Uh, many of them, most of them are going to be ineffective, many of, and most of them we're going to defend ourselves against. Uh, and um, uh, whenever we uh, conduct a, uh, a strike, we're going to hit at what we're aiming at, we're going to take away capability, we're going to, we're going to do what we're uh, uh, desiring to do. Uh, and so this, this particular attack uh, was egregious in that, it, you know, the attack uh, was on uh, the sleeping area of one of, of, of our base. And, and again, uh, we have, uh, uh, we, Qatab Hezbollah and, and other uh, elements uh, continue to um, uh, attack our troops. Uh, and, uh, and again, I think at this point, uh, we, we should, uh, it's time to uh, to take away even more capability than we've taken in the past. And in terms of the, the t you use the term escalation, we've not described what our what our response is going to be, uh, but we look to hold the people uh, that are responsible for this accountable, and we also look to make sure that uh, we continue to wait, take away capability from them as we go forward. Let's go. I, let's go to the next question. Washington Post, Missy. Um, welcome back, Mr. Secretary. Um, what, first of all, we, um, the Chairman of the House um, Armed Services Committee, one of the main oversight committees for this building, has asked if you will come testify on a specific date. Will you do that? And secondly, on the Middle East, what's your response to the criticism um, that the United States is sort of playing into the hands of the Houthis because the U.S. response is elevating their status, they've demonstrated an ability to withstand years of bombing in the past, and more broadly, playing into the hands of the Iranians that support the Houthis and the other groups, um, when the goal of President Biden in the United States has been to prevent increased violence um, in the Middle East, and, and now the United States is taking part in actually increasing it. Thanks. Uh, Missy, what was your the first part but, of your question? Um, testi what, will you testify as Chairman Rogers yeah. has asked? Yeah, so uh, Congress had, uh, had some uh, very relevant questions uh, that uh, they've asked us, uh, and we will continue to, uh, to answer those questions. Uh, we'll continue to work with uh, Chairman Rogers' office uh, to, uh, to, to address uh, ad any additional questions or issues that he might have. And again, we'll stay in touch with Chairman Rogers' office as, in, in, uh, you know, as things play out. So. I'm sorry, on the, the Middle East? 
Yeah. Are you playing into the hands of the Houthis in Iran more generally? Well, Missy, you know, if you take a look at what, what the Houthis are doing, I mean, they're, they're attacking uh, commercial shipping. You know, initially they said that uh, they were attacking commercial shipping because these ships were supporting Israel. Uh, they've attacked the uh, uh, ships that, 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 are, that have the interest of some 50 countries that are not supporting Israel. And, and so this is, this is an international crime. Uh, and, and this is something that we have to do about it. And I, in terms of elevating the status of the Houthis, I think we have to do something about that. This is not elevating their status. This is about preventing them from uh, having the ability to do what they've done in terms of attacking ships uh, and trying to sink ships uh, that have nothing to do with, uh, with, the, with the Israeli conflict. Let's go to CBS, David. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, we all saw a golf cart out in the hallway. Is, is, is that how you're getting around now? And how confident are you that your recovery is going to be complete enough to allow you to continue in what everybody recognizes as a very demanding job? Yeah, well, nobody recognizes that more than me, uh, but uh, uh, that's the first time I use that golf cart, by the way, and uh, but I think it's pretty neat. Um, my leg will continue to improve. improve. Uh, the doctors are confident that it will. Uh, the, my uh, PT specialist, who I think is a sadist, is uh, you know he continues to work me hard, and uh, and and he has confidence as well. It'll just take time because of the nature of the of the. Of the injury. Uh, no, they they can't put a number on them uh, in terms of days or, or or weeks, but but it'll be incremental improvement. I won't be ready for the Olympics, but uh, but I'll uh, I'll improve. So let's go to AFP. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, does the U.S. need to escalate its military actions or do something new or unprecedented in order to deter rounding its proxies? And, and if so, how can that be done without, um, without uh, sparking a broader conflict? I think everyone recognizes uh, the, the challenge associated with making sure that we hold the right people accountable, uh, that, uh, that we do everything necessary to protect our troops, and that we manage things so that it, they, they don't escalate. I don't think there's any, any set formula for doing this. I do think, though, that, uh, that in everything that we do, uh, as we work our way through our decision-making process with the National Security uh, um, Council, uh, we're, we're, we're managing all of that, looking at all of that, and, and we're using every instrument of national power to, to address various issues. So, so I think, I mean, there, there are ways to, uh, to, to manage this so it doesn't spiral out of control, and that's been our focus uh, throughout. Let's go to Al Jazeera. Thank you, um, Speedy recovery, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, I'm, I have two things. Um, in, back in December in your speech uh, at the Reagan uh, Library, you told the Israeli leaders they have to protect civilian lives in Gaza. Since that speech, 12,000 more Palestinians have been killed. <coughs> We're now at 27,000 killed. Why are you still supporting this war when this government that is the most extreme in the history of Israel, led by someone who refuses to recognize any political right for the Palestinians, and with elements that are calling for uh, ethnic cleansing and displacement of Palestinians? Do Palestinians have the right to dignity, as you said in Angola when I was with you on the trip, you said the future belongs to those who protect dignity, not trample it. Yeah. Um, I, I said that in the speech at the Reagan Forum. Uh, I've said that to my counterpart, Minister Gallant, every time that I talk to him, and I talk to him every week. Uh, and I, I emphasize the importance of uh, protecting uh, civilian lives. I also emphasize the importance of of providing humanitarian assistance to uh, the Palestinians. It's critical. It's, it's really important. Uh, this is, uh, there's no question that this is a tough, there's been a tough uh, conflict. Uh, but we're, as I said earlier, we are starting to see uh, the Israelis kind of shift their stance and, and change their approach to a more uh, focused uh, and uh, um, uh, a controlled, well, not, controlled is probably not the right word, but a more focused effort 
uh, focused on a discrete set of objectives. Uh, and so um, I think, uh, you know, we, we talked to them about that uh, weeks ago, uh, and uh, they said they were going to do that, and they are doing that. But I will continue to emphasize, and I know Secretary Blinken and President Biden will continue to emphasize the importance of addressing the issue of the Palestinian people. Uh, it, it's critical. And, uh, you know, we're doing more, uh, but, but we're not doing enough. So. Time for a few more. Let's go to CNN. Uh, Secretary, allow me to join my colleagues in wishing you a speedy recovery. Uh, the 30-day review is due in a matter of days now, uh, I think less than a week if I'm not mistaken. Do you commit to making that review public? And second question, has your Chief of Staff Kelly Maximin offered her resignation or have there been discussions about her resignation in the wake of the failure to notify? Um, I commit to being uh, as, as transparent as possible uh, and, uh, and sharing as much as possible. Um, uh, Orrin, you'll understand that because this is a command and control of uh, policies of, uh, of our government here, there will be uh, elements of this that are classified. But uh, we're committed to sharing uh, as, as much as possible, as soon as possible. And your chief of staff, has she offered her resignation? Uh, she has not. So. Okay, let's go to PBS, Nick. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I've seen what you're going through up close uh, among loved ones, so again, uh, we wish you full recovery, and, and I know it's possible, so thank you. Um, you described this as a gut punch, your instinct to privacy, but if I could just ask you bluntly, you had nearly a month between the time you learned of your cancer and the time that this came out to inform the President. How could you possibly think that it was okay not to tell him? Uh, if I could be blunt, and just a small question on Iran in the Middle East, what do you believe Iran knew operationally about the attack in Jordan, and, and how important is that when it comes to the U.S. response? So, um, when the diagnosis was made, um, doctor highlighted that you have a finite window of time to actually get this done. If you go beyond that, that window, then, then you will have a problem. Christmas holidays coming up. Uh, for me uh, to be have as li little impact on on uh, what we're doing in a department, Christmas was a time for me to uh, to take a look at getting that done. Uh, it was a tough decision for me, uh, and I did not decide until you know very close to when the procedure was done to actually uh, do the procedure. In terms of informing the president, again, I. Uh, I admit that that was a mistake to not talk to him about that early on. Uh, when you're the President of the United States, you got a lot of things on your plate. And so putting my personal uh, issue uh, on adding, adding to his, uh, all the things that he's got on his plate, I just didn't feel that that was, uh, that was a thing that I, I, I should do at the time. But again, I recognize that that was a mistake and uh, I should have done that differently. And what Iran knew about the attack in Jordan or how operationally it was involved? Um, you know, we believe that this was uh, done by an element of what is known as the uh, axis of resistance. Uh, and uh, these are Iranian proxy groups. Uh, and how much Iran knew or didn't know, we, we don't know. But it really doesn't matter because Iran sponsors these groups, it funds these groups, uh, and uh, in some cases, it, uh, it trains these groups on uh, advanced conventional weapons. Uh, and so, you know, I, again, I, I think without that facilitation, these kind of, kinds of things don't happen. Okay, let's go to FT and then Politico to close it out. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. Have you seen any signs that China has been successful in pressuring Iran to rein in the Houthis in the Red Sea? Uh, we, we have not. Um, Again, what's happening in terms of uh, close communications between between leaders, uh, you know, we we don't know, but uh, but we've not seen any visible evidence that they are they are encouraging or pressuring uh, Iran to uh, cause the Houthis to to back off of what they've been doing. Okay. Final question. Thank you. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Secretary. I also hope that you make a speedy recovery. I have two questions. Um, first of all, um, do you regret not personally telling the deputy the details the two times you, that you were in the hospital and the authorities were transferred to her? Do you think that she had a right to know? And then I have a question on the Middle East as well. 
Um, as you heard me say in my opening statement, uh, I apologize to all my colleagues uh, and, uh, and also the American people that, uh, that I wasn't as uh, transparent as I, I probably should have been up front. And then my second question, is there any discussion right now of withdrawing troops from either Syria or Iraq, especially given what has happened in the last couple of weeks? Um, what's happened in the last couple of weeks uh, is not driving us to um, uh, consider withdrawing troops for, uh, from Syria. There are ongoing discussions with the uh, Iraq, uh, Iraqi leadership about, uh, about our future footprint uh, in Iraq, and I think that's, that's been... Uh, uh, fairly well publicized, a high military commission. Uh, we've taken the first steps uh, in in conducting those meetings, uh, and so that will play out over time. Does that include discussions about withdrawing troops from Iraq? Uh, it, it, it'll include inc discussions about our footprint going forward, for sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much. Uh, we're still doing the forensics, Jan. But, um, most of the drones in the in the region uh, have a, have a connection with Iran. So, Mr. Secretary, why a multi-tiered response? Why not one and done and get it over with and going directly to the Iran? You know, I don't think the uh, the adversaries are of a one and done mindset, uh, and so uh, they have a lot of capability. I have a lot more, and, and so you know we. Uh, as I said earlier, we're going to do what's necessary to protect our troops and our interests. So. Also, also, thank you very much. If it's multi-tiered, thank you. Multi-tiered, thank you. Multi